Did you know Variety, the children's charity, is the entertainment charity started by a group of show business people who found an abandoned baby in a theatre way back in 1928. These kind-hearted performers raised so much money to help the lost child that they began helping other children. And Variety, the children's charity, was born. Read the full story and support the entertainer's charity that supports kids in need today. Visit variety.org.au. You're listening to the School of Hard Knock Knocks podcast with me, Maury Morgan. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, your next comedian. <laughs> Shouldn't drink on an empty head, you know that, don't you? That is the shittiest knuckle I've ever heard in my life. Everyone in this room is now dumb for having no. listened to it. That's a bucket list. <laughs> You have dangerously underprepared yourself for the shit that is about to get real. Tegan Higginbotham started comedy when in high school through the Class Clowns competition. Today, just shy of 30, Tegan has an impressive comedy resume, which includes writing columns, improv, sketch comedy and stand-up comedy at festivals right across Australia. This year also happens to be her 12th consecutive Melbourne International Comedy Festival. And that's only the half of it. In this School of Hard Knock Knocks podcast, Tegan discusses her TV and movie roles, particularly that Neighbours episode, how she successfully married sport and comedy for TV, and how she develops stand-up comedy shows. She also reminds all comedians that they need to be versatile to grow a strong comedy career. And talking about comedy careers, if you'd like to start one or are doing open mic nights but just not breaking through the glass ceiling, there's only a few spots left for our February 18-22 to stand-up comedy course in Melbourne with Elliot Goblet. Visit www.schoolofhardknockknocks.com for more information. And now, here's Tegan Higginbotham. I was at the shopping centre the other day, and I've realised that if you're in a public toilet, right, and the person in the cubicle next to you accidentally farts, (laughs) and then you laugh... They never come out. (laughs) But here's another, actually, a scary revelation. I was cleaning my bedroom the other day and I've realised that removing a pillow from its case is kind of like chatting with an ex, you know? You get one layer deep and it's like, Jesus, I used to sleep with that. (laughs) Why do you look like that now? Was I comfortable with you being so lumpy? I don't know. Oh, God, I had my mouth on you. Oh, God. I like sport a lot. I really do. In fact, here's something interesting. I don't know if you've heard this, but our pole dancing is currently trying to rebrand itself as pole sports and become an Olympic event. Yeah. It's going to be the first Olympic event in history where you get points depending on how hard things are for the spectators as well as the athletes. (laughs) I'm fascinated by pole dancing, though. I really am. Especially because they all get to choose their own really cool pole dancing nicknames. And I've been wondering what my cool pole dancing nickname would be. Um, I'm narrowing down between a few. Uh, I've got Champagne Destiny. A little bit of love, not much. Okay, what about Honey Star with two R's, so it's classy? (laughs) What about this one? I'm a bit of a nerd at heart. Love my Star Wars films. What do you think about this one? Empress Pole Patine. (laughs) Or the final, the final nerdy option, okay? The final one, Poldemort. Good morning, Tegan. Hey, Maury, how are you? Oh, very good, very good. You're in Melbourne today. I am in Melbourne, which is uh, which is nice. It was it was about 35 and unbearable recently, but uh, mm. it's gone nice and cool at the moment. So I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> mm, excellent. Yeah, it is nice. That's the nice thing about Melbourne. You've got uh, yeah, you've got that heat wave, and then you've got the chill that comes afterwards. It's unlike, say, Singapore, which never changes. I've not been to Singapore yet, but, um, yeah, I've heard that if I go there, I'll lose an awful lot of water weight. So, you know, maybe it's kind of like something you can do as an alternative to I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. Just I'm going to go sit in Singapore for five days. (laughs) There you go. Perfect. All right. Well, 
Tegan Higginbotham. Now, I've pronounced that uh, a way that I believe you prefer, but it is some people say Higginbotham. Look, I, I'm sure that my mother would prefer it if the entire world said Higginbotham. Mm. But, you know, I, I, will, I will settle with whatever people say as long as it's not Higginbottom. Although that is how I am predominantly introduced on stages. Or just Tegan Higginbotham. You know that thing where you trail yeah, off at right. the end? I get that one a lot as well. Yep, 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 yep. You couldn't, like, HB or something as a Nick Tegan HB or something? <laughs> No, I don't really get HB. I get Teagues at best, but I haven't had I haven't had a lot of nicknames really. No. Well, let's delve down. Anyone who knows you and has seen you on TV or uh, seen you on stage knows that you're uh, well a, a very talented comedian. And in my research, I actually saw the word neighbours written next to your name. I know, we're going to go there. <laughs> I never knew. It was one episode, but we've, we'll get there in a moment. Now, uh, before we begin, uh, you do. when I did my research, it said that you are a self-described nerd. Now, when you say nerd, what do you mean? Are, you, are we talking Dungeons and Dragons nerd? Yeah. Or are we just talking about memorising the Carlton Football Club statistics? Oh, look, I wish I could memorise the Carlton Football Club statistics. Um, given the amount of talk I do about sport, I wish they had a brain for statistics, but they just don't stay. No, unfortunately, it's 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 not nearly as useful as that. I I'm a big old fan of you know Star Wars, Star Trek, mm-hmm. Harry Potter was my thing when I was growing up. Right. That said, it's very strange that you've gotten that quote from Wikipedia, and <laughs> other than the fact that I'm baffled that I have a Wikipedia page, yeah. I don't know who writes these things. So it's somebody has set that up for me. They know my birthday, where I grew up. They mm. they know that I'm a nerd. And it's like, cool. I mean, it's true, I suppose. Would I have defined myself like that for all of the internet to read? Probably not. But still, it's out there now. So I just get to talk about how passionate I am about being in Gryffindor House. It's, oh. it's not bad. Oh, there you go. Good. Well, I'll make sure that I update your page and say, not Dungeons and Dragons, nerd. (laughs) No, not Dungeons and Dragons. I had to do a big live Dungeons and Dragons show towards the end of last year. Oh, yeah? And, um, yeah, it was uh, for PAX, which is Penny Arcade Exhibition something. I don't Mm -hmm. even know what the full thing's called. Mm. Um, Expo, actually, that's what it would be. Penny Arcade Expo is this big touring game expo, and they came out to Melbourne. And um, I did a show uh, with a group called Dungeon Crawl, and it was really fun, but I clearly didn't know what was going on. (laughs) (laughs) So you have no idea the difference between, say, a nine-sided or 20-sided dice then? Oh, look, if you show me it, I'd, I'd like to think I could identify the difference, but what use they are in the game context no idea as a former dungeons and dragons player yeah you're not quite nerd level for me but anyways we'll move on we'll move on now look you're i believe you're under 30 is that right you're turning the magic 30 this year i will be turning big yeah big three oh well your wikipedia page says your age so uh, yeah i could find that but uh, you, you started comedy at the at the variety age of 17 now i believe you were in class clowns which is the high school equivalent of raw comedy. Yeah, I was in Class Clowns, which given where I think I was aged in high school, I may even have been 16 because I was one of those ones that was always Mm. too young to get my license in high school. And I'm pretty sure I did Class Clowns when I was in year 11. Um, But yeah, Class Clowns is, it's an incredible competition that's run by the Melbourne Comedy Festival that, uh, that invites high school students to perform. And basically, you know, you go through heats and then semi-finals, blah, 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 until you get up to the big national final, which, which is held during comedy festival time. And I did that, uh, with a couple of other guys in my year level. And it was my first real, I guess, big stage shot at performing comedy. And I absolutely Mm -hmm. adored it. I really, really adored it. And prior to that, did someone say to you, look, Tegan, you're really funny, you should try it, or have you always been the class clown at school? Uh, No, I was really quiet at school. I think a a lot of comedians kind of were. You know, I was... um, Mm -hmm. I I liked doing my work and kind of kept to myself, but there would be the, the... outcast drama kids and I hung out with those guys a lot I'd always been drawn to the comedic roles in plays but I always saw myself becoming just an actress a straight actress um Fortunately, though, my year 12 drama teacher was a guy called Robbie Lloyd, Mm -hmm. who had been involved with improvising in Melbourne for a really long time. He used to run Impro Sundays at the Comics Lounge, was part of a comedy trio trio, sorry, called The Dodge, who were part of the Melbourne comedy scene. So through him as well, I started becoming exposed you know, it said to that impro group, I'd go out and watch them on Sundays. Yep. I'd go to comedy festivals to watch um, him and his friends and the other people I was meeting. So slowly just began to get an introduction and a taste for the scene. Yep. So you wanted to be an actor and then you, you had mm-hmm. this sort of niche interest in 
in comedy through this uh, through this this teacher that you described. Mm-hmm. How did you do, by the way, at Class Clowns? Um, I, we got into the national finals, and if my memory is correct, I think I was beaten that year by Tom Ballard and Aman Hadici, who there are still go. very active in the comedy scene. I'm pretty sure that was how it went. I think it was like, yeah, they, they both drew and were both winners at the same time. Wow. Um, yeah, I remember that the, they were both part of the competition that year. Mm. You'd need to double-check that, but I think that's how it went. Well, that sounds right. I know Tom was in uh, and was a finalist um, and a winner at uh, at Class Clowns. And, uh, yeah, great things happen to, to those that win these competitions like Raw, like Class Clowns. Yeah. Now, so you did this thing and you, you obviously got the itch. Do you remember your first paid gig? When did you decide, nah, now, now it's time to go professional. I'm going to get a gig. I mean, were you underage? How did you get into a club? Uh, I just kind of went in. Um, I, I, as soon as I left high school, so as soon as I left year 12, I joined a comedy group called The Hounds, which was myself, the drama teacher I formerly mentioned, uh, Robbie Lloyd, and mm-hmm. another guy, Adam McKenzie. So we put together this yep. comedy trio and we did uh, the Melbourne Fringe, Adelaide Fringe Comedy Festival, and we just started, uh, yeah, working from there. Um I, I remember that because I had these two people who'd already been in the industry for 10 years and had already kind of yep. worked themselves into a position where they were getting paid for things, I just kind of got to ride on their coattails for a while and mm. they just had to divide it by three. So it was really good for me. And I um, I continued working with the Hounds for about five years. Yep. And then we had a change up and Rob, Rob Lloyd went in his own direction and I've continued working with Adam McKenzie ever since then. Yep. Uh, we're now part of a group called Watson um, mm-hmm. with Liam Ryan. So yeah, this year will be my 12th consecutive comedy festival in a row. And wow. yeah, nearly all of them have had some involvement with Adam McKenzie. So yep. I'm pretty yep. proud of that little working relationship. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. And you have done solo shows as well though. Yeah. So about, I think it was about five or six years in, I'm really terrible with years and remembering all the sort of stuff. There we go. There's oh. that statistic okay. brain of mine. Um, I decided to give Stand Up a go. So the very first year I did a show, I did a split bill with a lady called um, Kate O'Neill, who was a friend I'd met. And that was really good, Mm -hmm. just kind of having to get used to being on stage by myself. Um, So she did half an hour of stand-up. I did half an hour of stand-up. And it was amazing. After having been in a trio for so many years, little basic things would happen. Like I'd forget to stop talking and take a breath Mm -hmm. because I was used to the fact that generally it would be somebody else's line and then I'd get to stand back for a second you know, regain my thoughts and all that yeah. sort of stuff. But when you're up there by yourself, you really do need to be practiced in, yeah, taking that moment to have a sip of water or yep. breathe, you know, those handy things that you need. Yeah, um, so my first, yeah, God, I felt like for years of making that jump from sketch into stand-up, I was just a bit of a disaster. And what's more is I could probably perform in front of 100,000 people if I was working with Adam McKenzie, and I don't think I'd be that yep. worried if you put me in front of 10 people by myself, nerves are still an issue. So it's just, you know, it's about, wow. you know, defining your comfort zones and having to deal with those areas where you don't feel as comfortable. So for you, that that journey was what, improv and then sketch comedy and then stand up, solo stand up? Yeah, I mean, it's all been kind of mixed in. I still do improv and sketch comedy. The show I'm doing this year is sketch, but that was mm-hmm. certainly, I guess, the main focus of the journey. Yeah. And if I if I read between the lines correctly, the solo stand up comedy was the most challenging for you? Yeah, definitely. It really was. I mean, improv could be challenging just depending on whether you've got a day where your brain's firing or not. <laughs> if yep. you go on those slow days, improv is a disaster. Yeah. Um, but yeah, stand up is, it is a challenge. And I try to take that in my stride. You know, I've listened to stand ups who I look up to, people such as Judith Lucy, who yep. still talk about getting nervous. Yep. And you kind of go, well, I suppose it's just how you're meant to feel. It is a strange thing. It's a weird, weird thing to do right. stand up and to stand in front of a group of people and make them laugh. So I think it's natural that you do you know, have mixed emotions about it. Mm, That's good. Well, to anyone listening to this podcast who does improv or sketch comedy, stand-up comedy is the next challenge for you. So if you're not getting nervous in what you're doing currently, try solo stand-up, says Tegan. Well, now that you do uh, all of those things that you've described, a little bit of improv, sketch comedy and stand-up, how do you generate new content? I think it's just about day-to-day. I mean... 
Sometimes I like the idea of setting myself an actual project, um, as was with the first two solo stand-up mm-hmm. shows I did. The first one was focused primarily on boxing, which involved me actually having to go away and learn to box, have a fight, and take lots of notes throughout that experience. Right. The second one was an exploration into a person who I'd been a fan of as I was growing up, which yep. was a, an ex-footballer called Brendan Favola. So that took a lot of research, a lot of, you know, I went out and had interviews with him. Um, mm-hmm. That one was a really interesting one to put together. And so sometimes I really prefer going instead of just like it's a show about my life, I will go, I choose to want to learn about this and I will document that and hopefully the comedy will, will come from that. But, you know, to each their own. Some people are just so excellent at living day to day and reporting back and making it funny. It's just really whatever your style is, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, fair enough. Um, was he, I assume he was a Carlton player, was he, Brendan? Yes, he was, yeah. So he was really big when I was kind of just really getting interested in football. Yep. Um, but he was a very contentious player. You know, he was, his emotions played havoc with him on the field. Sometimes he'd just be off and um, and he got into, you know, a fair bit of trouble. There was the Lara Bingle nude photo uh, in the shower scandal. Yep. Um, he had a, he had issues with, with gambling and, yeah, he was a very, very controversial figure and still is in some ways, although he's made a very lucrative career out of being an ex-footballer. Mm. So because we, if we, you know, if you Google you and you Google images, um, you know, for, for legitimate reasons, there you are with your Carlton jersey on. Have you always been a Carlton fan? Yes. Or is, is, does it run through the Higginbothams? Always. It does, it does. And if I have my way, any nieces and nephews will be Carlton supporters as well. It's just how it goes in our family. Oh, very good. Well, please don't hang up. I'm a Collingwood fan. Collingwood, there we go. <laughs> there we go. I can hear it. I are you still there? The Hello? Voice. Hello? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you saw that? Okay, good. <laughs> yes, well, yeah, although, my goodness, my son, uh, being the antagonist and a potential stand-up comedian at the age of eight, decides he wants to follow <laughs> the cats, and there goes uh, four generations of Collingwood fan. That's an interesting club to jump onto. Yeah, it's cute, and he's eight, so we have to, yeah. Push that out of him. Well, there you go. So now it's a good segue, perfect segue now, to talk about sports. So you've you've gone from uh, your sketch comedy, you've gone into performing stand-up, and then somehow sport got involved, and you described that your show makes sense now. You did a show about boxing, and then you did a show about a Carlton yep. footballer. Um, how? What was the? At what point did you did you decide to marry your passion for say sport and comedy? Um, well, I know that things were helped along by the fact that uh, an editor at the Sunday Age Sports, I believe that he'd seen both the boxing and the Brennan Favola show, and asked me if I was interested okay. in taking that further and writing columns for him, which was something that initially terrified me because I, you know, yeah. I'm somebody who still has to remind myself occasionally how to spell there, there, and there. You know, <laughs> so it seemed very, very, uh, very, like a very big jump for me. But that was something that I did decide to do and have absolutely adored doing ever since. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it wasn't necessarily a, an active, I suppose, decision to marry sport and comedy. It was just that I happened to like talking about sport and I was a comedian. You know yep. what I mean? Yep. Yep. Oh, that that makes sense. And, and I mean, you've followed that quite strongly. I mean, Sideliners was the last uh, sport comedy marriage, I believe, that you were involved with. <laughs> Yeah, so it was just the most fun show. I got to um, do a panel show with Nicole Livingston last mm. year on the ABC and getting to work with her and meet so many athletes week after week. It was it was just incredible, actually. <laughs> it was one of those ones where I kept on having to go, oh, my God, it's real. One series only? Or was there more on the horizon? Look, I hope there is. We um we were given 12 episodes and we did 12 episodes and it's now that thing of seeing if they want us to come back and do another 12. But, mm-hmm. yeah, I don't know. I kind of just appreciate it and... Anything else will be a cherry on top. Well, there you go. 12 is, is excellent. And we're not in the sporting space yet because Aussie rules and rugby haven't kicked off yet. And Well, they do this Friday. So we're, we're getting in oh, there. Oh, that's right. Mm, all right. Well, uh, ABC, if you're listening to this, please uh, make a couple of phone calls. Lickety split. Yeah. yeah well, <laughs> yeah. Now, um, so there you go. So Sideliners, uh, a lot of people know you from Sideliners in terms of television. Let's go way back. Let's go to that neighbour's comment I made earlier. So... You had you played a character on Neighbours one episode. You had a speaking role. What what? Yep. What happened in that episode? Taylor. Uh, what that was? Well, I you know I'd been auditioning with Jan Russ, who was the casting agent over at Neighbours for a little while. Actually, she tried me out for a few roles, and then I finally got this role, and I was like, Oh my god, everybody, you have to watch Neighbours. And then um, 
and then I realized that it was uh, it was not the greatest role. There was a character in the series I didn't watch Neighbors. Right. I think her name was Bridget or something like that, and oh. she'd been in a car accident. And the whole point of my character was to highlight to Bridget how much worse things could have been for her if she'd ended up like me. So I can't in support kind of the one and only uh, – <laughs> oh, I did. they didn't write that in. I had demanded it. <laughs> um, I got lowered into a swimming pool while sitting in a wheelchair by a small crane. <gasps> so, yeah, that was my time on Neighbours, and I, I went from insisting everybody record it and watch it on their televisions to – Telling them not to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So you played. You'd had a, what a, 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 a nasty accident. You'd fallen off your bicycle. Yeah, sometime I think. Or? Well, look, they didn't really flesh out my character too much. Oh. I'm going to be honest, but I assume that that is what their intention was. That I'd also had a nasty accident and I'd come out of it much worse than than Bridget had. Oh, uh, yeah. right, right. So it was almost like a sliding doors, except um, you were a real person. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're not a variation of the original. Oh, yeah. Davis goes deep. Uh, Neighbors All right, so Neighbours, fantastic. And you've also done a number of uh, game shows. There was Whose Line Is It Anyway? Um, mm-hmm. There was, and also movies, I should say. So uh, you were in The Heckler with CJ Fortuna. CJ Fortuna was our guest comedian last week uh, at our stand-up comedy school. Fantastic guy. And in um, The Heckler, he plays the bad guy. Um, and Oddball, which is, uh, was it Shane Jacobson was was in that. Yep. I was a bad guy in old oddball. Killed a lot of penguins. Oh. Made me feel pretty good about myself. Right, right. Um, yeah, so a uh, big shout out to anyone in Warnable. If you've been to Warnable, no doubt you've seen posters and know the story of oddball. Yeah, no, no, definitely in Warnable. I think there was a big sign up there for a while. I haven't actually traveled back for quite some time, but I really liked it down there. Everybody seems to make fun of Warnable, but then I went there and was like, well, this is lovely. Yeah, it is. I look and it's. Uh, I think Warnable is uh, punching above its weight in terms of comedy because you've got well your nemesis, the, the the gentleman Tom Ballard, who stole your title at uh, Class Clowns. He's from Warnable, and in fact, C.J. Fortuna, who I just mentioned, he's also from. I thought Dave Hughes was also from Warnable. Not You're sure correct, about yeah. that, but he might have been as and, well. Yeah, C.J. Fortuna and Dave Hughes, both both from Warnable as well. So yeah, in terms of a small town, it does punch above its weight. And what's going on in the bull? Yeah. So how did you – yeah, tell us about that. So obviously you were passionate about, about acting. Did you keep one foot in the acting world as you were doing comedy or – Absolutely. I mean, it's, you know, as many people who are going to get into stand-up will probably have already experienced themselves, the arts industry in Australia is very small. And mm-hmm. I think that if you close yourself down and only focus on one thing, you know, you're, you're probably missing a lot of opportunities – which is why I like to keep writing, keep doing stand-up as often as I can, keep doing yep. sketch, keep acting whenever the opportunities arise. Because you think if you want to have a career in this country, you really can't be all that, you know, all that selective. Some people can, and that's very, very lucky of them. Yep. But you look at most of the people who have made really viable careers in Australia, and they're versatile. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Well, that's a good segue now to my question about being versatile, um, not only in an acting performing sense, but also in a psychological and mental sense. All people who hit a level of stardom on TV or stand up, they get criticism. I imagine you've had your own share of criticism over the years. How do you cope with it? For people who are listening to this podcast who haven't quite, you know, they, they haven't, they're not stars yet, but they will be, but they hope, they are going to hit a wall, a glass ceiling, where people are going to be negative, perhaps even more negative than they are positive. How did you cope? Well, I mean, first of all, I don't necessarily think it always comes from being on television. Sometimes the the biggest or the most criticism I would get would be directly after an open mic stand-up gig where you do have a Mm -hmm. lot of other comedians and sometimes people are sharing feedback in a really positive way, as I'm sure you'd have, you know, at your workshops and all that sort of stuff. Sometimes you just have people that give you a bit of shit and it can be really Mm -hmm. tricky uh, figuring out how, how much of that feedback is good and you need to take on board and how much of it is just people being assholes, which will happen. Mm, But um, mm. sometimes the hardest criticism I've got is the stuff that, you know, you do get really emotional about it at the beginning and then you can head away, think about it for a bit and go, oh, well, maybe there is actually a point in there. And if you can take yep. some stuff and learn from it and improve, then that's amazing. But then also you do have to know that sometimes people are going to have another opinion, even if technically in some way they're right. If you're backing yourself and if you believe that you have a style 
or a joke or if you're if you're trying something new and you just think that it's the right way to go you've got to you've got to keep going forwards with that i mean you think about mm. some of the very strange alternative comedians who are doing so well in our country like sam simmons for example mm. I, I mean yeah. i cannot even imagine how long it took him to really perfect that that style that he has got going i remember yeah. seeing ronnie chang trying his yeah. you know on stage persona out in the clubs and literally seeing how it sometimes it would work really well. Sometimes he'd take the angriness a little bit too far and it wasn't as good a gig <laughs> and kind yes. of getting to watch that and then see it shape into what is now just this, this world class act that he has. And I was really yeah. lucky that I got to see that evolution. And mm. I'm sure that there would have been people at times, you know, giving them both feedback going, this is wrong or this isn't working. Yeah. And you've got to be selective in what you take on board, what you let hurt you, what you let change you. Because criticism, yeah, it, it can at times be really wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, Ronnie Chang's amazing. Um, I did enjoy his TV series, uh, The International Student. which uh, Yeah, it was incredible. Yeah, really good yeah. work. Yeah. I, I, I well, when, when I was going through uni just down the road at RMIT, I had a lot of international students in my year, so I could relate from a pers- certain perspective uh, on yeah. what he was talking about, which is funny. He's an interesting character. If you look at his um, how he's he, how he looks over the last say five years, I think he's reverse aging. He looks younger now than he did when he was at university. He was kind of puffy. Yeah, I think. Yeah, something about um, America does that to people. I think you just get fitter hmm. if you're in the TV industry in America. You just look better. Maybe, maybe. Someone's obviously said, you know, you, what do they say? You put 10, 20 pounds on, on TV or something? Or something like that, yeah. Yeah. So he's gone, yep, all right, I'm on a low-carb diet. He looks great. Well, there you go. We're talking about the future and... We've got the Melbourne International Comedy Festival, got a, a bunch of other, you know, Perth and Adelaide and, and Sydney. And what is in store for Tegan Higginbotham? Well, the Women's Football League kicks off this Friday, which I'm so excited about. Um, and I'll mm. fortunately be getting to do a little bit of work around that. And then Comedy Festival will be coming up next, where I will be doing another show with Adam McKenzie. As I said, this one will be the 12th in a, in a row. Great. Um, and that's going to be really fun. And then otherwise, I'm just going to be... Yeah, just kind of just bumbling along and doing a lot of writing this year. I've been um, mm. hoping to write a book for quite a few years now, so I'm going to give it a whirl and see if I um, if I can wear mm. that hat. Wizard, uh, what theme is your book on? I mean, not, not another Carlton uh, player story, Pretty much. It? No, it's just, yeah, it's <laughs> another love story to Brennan Favola. We'll see how it goes in bookstores. Right. I'm expecting big things. Right. I did enjoy your, I think you had a post about um, uh, Aussie Rules players and how they were coming out with books and they all wanted to show their, their independence and their unique style and their book covers were essentially all the same, sort of black background. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that was a classic. Cool thing. I, you, I mean, I you should like do the same. They've got in, yeah, I know. They've got to change it up just a little bit, just yeah. a little bit. Add some yellow or red or something, yeah. Blue, dark yeah. blue and black. Hmm, there you go. Well, and if someone wants to get in contact with you, you know, if the ABC's lost your number and they're like, oh, how do we get then We want to get Sideline as a Series 2, but we can't find her in the Rolodex. How does anyone get in contact with Tegan to uh, you know, talk about projects? Maybe get you on TV again. Ideally, I mean, I think sometimes I see messages on Twitter, but I'm trying to do that thing of getting off social media a little bit. You know, you just read so mm. much about how it's very negative for you. So I am trying to look at it less and less and less. That's one of my resolutions for this year. But I'm really lucky in that a few years ago I um, I got a manager and so she has to deal with all that, that shit now, which is excellent. Mm. And how? so someone just uh, Googles Tegan and then the manager's yeah, number I will think, come up? Yeah, I think it's listed at most of, on most of my social media pages. So right. I've I've I've, I've oh. made work really t- uh, difficult for her. I've certainly not kept it a secret. <laughs> mm. Perfect. Well, there you go. Well, Tegan, thanks very much for sharing your journey through, well, th- from early days of uh, class clowns into doing sketch comedy, doing your own Melbourne International Comedy Festival at such an early age, uh, and then doing great things in TV. Uh, not necessarily uh, neighbours, but the other stuff, and. Um, and then more, yeah. And then really bringing women to the forefront in sport, which I, you know, I commend you. It's um, I personally, I'll be, I'll be watching the women's football, the AFL uh, myself. It's uh, actually an amazing game. It is, and it's Carlton versus Collingwood this weekend. Sorry, this Friday night actually. Bingo. So there you go. You have definitely right. got to tune in. Well, expect a rude text message from me when we beat you. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> well, we beat you last year, so you never know. Uh-huh. Yeah. No. Um, well, it was lovely to chat. Thank you very much. Well, Tegan, thanks very much for your time and um, have a great week.